Hello, and welcome to ICS Live, the International Continent Society's continuing series of online educational broadcasts. Today's topic is 10 Pearls for Managing Chronic Pelvic Pain in Patients with Mesh Complications. My name is Nina Davis. I am Professor of Urology and Gynecology at Oregon Health and Science University. I am privileged to introduce today's discussants, Dr. Christine Whitmore, Professor of Urology and Urogynecology at, Drex at Drexel University, and ICS's Educational Committee Chair, Dr. Lee Stay, Associate Professor of Urology at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We have no disclosures. This webinar derives from our ongoing ICS initiatives to establish best practices and educate those caring for people with pelvic pain. The related educational videos are available within the School of Pelvic Pain of the ICS Institute and the standardization documents can be downloaded for free along with other ICS educational materials. Christine, as a member of the Pelvic Pain Working Group, can you please provide us background for today's presentation? Chronic pelvic pain affects at least 16% of females. Chronic pelvic pain present after pelvic floor reconstructive surgery is not uncommon and the role of MESH as a contributor needs to be determined in order to provide adequate management. Chronic pelvic pain present before pelvic floor reconstructive surgery needs to be addressed prior to surgery with patient education as to the cause of the pain, not necessarily due to prolapse. The fundamentals of chronic pelvic pain include non-cyclic chronic pelvic pain of greater than three months duration, characteristics such as location perception modality, domains, which organ systems are involved, and what are the overlying aspects, and organ site-specific versus the central nervous system, identifying the inciting event, whether it be surgery, trauma, hormonal manipulation, or even a major change in physical activity. Comorbid conditions like autoimmune diseases uh, are often present and important to identify each pain generator and treat concurrently. So the location can be reported as in the pelvis, lower abdomen, low back, medial aspect of the thigh or inguinal area. The patient's perception can be sharp, burning, a pressure discomfort, dull ache or throbbing. The modality is persistent or continuous, but also may be reported as recurrent, episodic, or cyclic, which tends to become persistent with time. So the domains then include lower urinary tract, female and male genitalia, gastrointestinal pain, musculoskeletal pain, neuropathic pain, and the overlays, psychological aspects, sexual aspects, and the comorbidities, often more than one domains is involved, hence the need for a comprehensive evaluation. In this depiction, musculoskeletal, gastrointestinal, urologic, and gynecological domains, as well as dyspareunia, are all affected by psychological overlay. Psychological factors modulate patients' responses to pain, so they need to be addressed in evaluating and treating chronic pelvic pain syndromes. When discussing the benefit of including a psychological treatment component, it is important to validate the physiologic basis of disease and to explore psychological factors as a key aspect of a multi-component approach to the pain. It's not all in their head. More than 70% have depression and or anxiety. Thank you for that overview. Our goal today was to give our colleagues tools to bring back to their practices. Our first pearl has to do with the initial history, which will draw out which domains are involved and establish the therapeutic relationship. We find it most helpful to allow the patient to tell his or her story free form and to interrupt or redirect only when they become more poorly organized. The history including childhood bedwetting, urinary tract infections, abuse, as well as current adult medical and surgical history 
can be quite relevant. The patient should arrive to the visit with records available, prior treatments and responses documented, and questionnaires completed. This saves the practitioner a great deal of time. There are multiple published questionnaires available, but in our three clinics, we use selections of the Visual Analog Scale for Pain and Sex, the PIS-QIR, which is the Pelvic Organ Prolapse Incontinence Sexual Questionnaire, Iuga Revised, the FSFI, the Female Sexual Function Index, ICIQF LUTs, International Consultation on Incontinence Questionnaire, Female Lower Urinary Tract Symptoms, the O'Leary Stant Symptom and Problem Indices, the Genitourinary Pain Index, the Brief Pain Inventory Short Form, and the Bowel Impact Questionnaire, which is Initial Measurement of Patient Reported Pelvic Floor Complaints Tool. Self reported pain mapping can be very helpful. Here pictured are examples from the map network pain map, and the International Pelvic Pain Society history document. In these days of virtual visits, it's certainly possible to get an initial screening examination by performing a thorough history, and it is also an opportunity to initiate patient education. But physical examination is essential as soon as feasible to confirm the nature of the syndrome. Christine, could you please describe how you do your examination? Well, basically, the physical exam will assess the standard anatomic features, such as bladder, cervix, uterus, adnexa, anus and rectum, abdomen, low back, and sacrum. But perhaps more importantly, it is essential to evaluate for mucosal abnormalities of the vulvar skin and for the presence of trigger points in the musculoskeletal system. In the next several slides, we will discuss evaluation of the mucosal and internal muscles, muscular structures, the most critical portions of the exam. And this, the Q-tip touch sensitivity test, the skein's osteo at 1 and 11 o'clock and the vestibular osteo at 5 and 7 o'clock are evaluated for a moistened Q-tip. Often one can see erythemia at the osteo. But let's not forget about the clitoris and the anterior and posterior fourchette. Studies using an algesiometer have been shown to be important to quantify a sensory th threshold as a way to follow the patient objectively. The Oxford scale is a well-known scale used commonly to assess pelvic floor muscle strength. Zero meaning nothing, nil. Five being a very strong isolated contractions where the examiner's finger is elevated against stronger resistance. Assessing for high tone in the pelvic floor muscles is different than assessing strength. Here we're looking for trigger points in the levator complex, the obturator internus, and deep pelvis. We want to reproduce dyspareunia, superficial D, or we want to reproduce through the trigger point a referral pattern to the bladder, to the lower back, to the groin. We can also determine laterality. The scoring for muscle hypertonus, zero is no pressure or pain, and four is severe pain with the exam. They should not be able to contract the pelvic floor muscle because of the pain. If we look at the clock, 12 to three, patients left obturator internus, three to six, levator, six to nine, right levator, A9, and nine to 12, right obturator internus. Another way to look at muscle overactivity is firmness. We can liken this to the Thaner eminence, uh, where you can put your finger at a 45 degree angle over the Thaner eminence, and that would be normal. If you oppose to the first finger, that would be moderate. And if you oppose to the small finger, that would be severe. 70% of those with a history of trauma or infection of the genital urinary region have abnormal standing posture, head forward, abnormal gait, frozen, abnormal sitting, slouching, and chest breathing only instead of taking deep breaths. So this is something very general, but it's simple observation and can help us to delineate musculoskeletal and neurological etiologies for the pain. After the history and physical exam, we have an idea of what workup the situation warrants. So what clinical tools do we use? 
Clinical tools can expand the information provided by the exam depending on one's clinic resources. You don't have to run a major pain sensor to do a great workup for pain. Avoiding diary gives a great deal of information about bladder function and habits. Assessment of post-void residual is considered essential in most cases. Cultures are obtained where relevant. One considers Euroflow, Eurodynamics, cystoscopy, and an anesthetic challenge, which we will discuss later, based on patient circumstances. For example, one would perform cystoscopy in a patient who presents with urge incontinence refractory to medication, or Eurodynamics in someone with pelvic floor dysfunction and voiding symptoms who did not improve with pelvic physiotherapy downtraining. Pelvic manometry can be used to assess pelvic floor strength, but remember in our clinical practices, we can also assess this on physical exam without need for instrumentation. Suspected bladder outlet obstruction, tumor, stones, urethral diverticulum, mesh erosion, and detrusor overactivity are examples of diagnoses that will require further directed evaluation. To expand on the usefulness of the voiding diary, we use it to screen for polyuria, including excess urine production at night, represented by greater than 35% of the 24-hour urine volume being produced during the sleep cycle. Particularly small volume or large volume voids or 24-hour voided volumes out of the norm can help direct the evaluation. It is always interesting to find a patient who's living on diet soda or green tea, who has pedal edema leading to large nighttime volumes, or who drinks five liters of fluid per day in whom behavioral modifications can have a profound impact. So Christine, how do you use avoiding diary in your practice? Bladder pain patients avoid fluids because of the fear of voiding the pain. The maximum void volumes are often less than 200 cc's and nocturia times four to six is not unusual. So Nina, we've gone through the fundamentals. Let's apply them to a real patient. I think before we do that, we have one excellent question that's come up that's relevant to our initial evaluation of the chronic pain patient. This is from Marcio. And he says, is there a role for gluten-free diet in patients with chronic pelvic pain? This is quite trendy. Uh, I'm going to start by saying uh, in my patient population, this is not proven to affect pelvic pain, either in the chronic pelvic pain patient or the uh, interstitial cystitis uh, painful bladder syndrome patients. Now, this is separate from the patients that are actually diagnosed with celiac disease or other gastrointestinal disorders. What about your practices? So I, I can take that one. Um, uh, a gluten intolerance or gluten allergy is a cause of small fiber polyneuropathy, which we'll talk about later, but that entity, which is more of a systemic neuropathy, which can affect autonomic function, is reversible in approximately 40% of cases. So with some further workup, I might consider recommending that. Um, and some patients will try the anti-inflammatory diets on their own. There's really no major reason not to have them do it, but certainly there's no great data outside of specific diagnoses. Thank you, Elise. I think we'll go on then. Okay. Um, let's Let's apply the principles that we've reviewed to a patient who developed pain only after she had a surgical mesh repair for prolapse. Our first case is a 42-year-old female, Gravita 2 Para 2 postal worker. She complains of progressive stress urinary incontinence after a vaginal birth of a healthy male associated with a forceps delivery. She also notes bulge with exertion and at the end of the day. She has splinting with bowel movements. Also, she complains of groin pain and low back pressure and pain, which she attributes to her prolapse. She denies any other pain history and her PISQIR shows good sexual function. Christine, could you please describe this patient's evaluation? Absolutely. On physical examination, she uh, has a POPQ stage three. If you look at the vertical circle, cervix, total vaginal length, and the D are the apex, which in this case comes down to the introitus. Her external genitalia are normal. Her Q-tip touch test is negative. 
her bladder and urethra are non-tender. There is no suprapubic tenderness. The external pelvis is stable. The pelvic floor muscles are graded to two over five in strength, and they are non-tender. The perineometry is consistent with low tone, low pressure, 10 centimeters of water pressure, with contraction only 30, and then back to 10 at rest. So the patient goes on and she has surgery. She has a super cervical hysterectomy, stapled copalpexy, a trans obturator mid urethral sling, and perineal feet. She had an uneventful recovery with postoperative incisions, well healed, normal voiding, normal defecation, and no groin or low back pain. She has normal sexual activity beginning at six weeks post op. She has normal voiding and defecatory function at six months post op. However, at about 12 months post-op, she's complaining of progressive pelvic pain. Now, she reports suprapubic pressure on bladder filling. She goes 10 to 12 times during the day, three to five times at night. She has increased urgency. She does not feel as though she's emptying her bladder. She reports vulvar burning and superficial and deep dyspareunia. She also reports defecatory dysfunction and pain after defecation. She has pain with sitting. She has pelvic pain with walking. Her head is forward and her mobility in the hips is markedly decreased. So chronic pelvic pain after mesh surgery, the uh, external genitalia um, are and the gait is restricted with pelvic mobility and the head forward. In summary, we have a patient who previously had prolapse-related discomfort and no pelvic pain syndrome. She now has multiple components consistent with classic post-mesh pelvic pain. Elise, what should our colleagues be thinking about now? Well, with the mesh clearly eroded, the temptation might be to rush into surgery, and certainly that's probably going to be what the patient is asking for. But now we have a more complicated picture on our hands. So concurrent with planning for definitive therapy, we need to intervene on the multiple generators of her pain. We never underestimate the benefits of a comfortable vaginal surface. The region is so well innervated distally, it will ramp up any other painful process on the, if the, in the pelvis if it's not addressed. So in this case, whereas we have identified her surgery and mesh erosion as an issue, we are also going to employ conservative intervention on her inflamed vulvar mucosa and high tone pelvic floor muscles as we work toward her surgical intervention. By the time we go to surgery, the vulva will be in better condition to heal and the pelvic floor muscles relaxed and functional. This might be the most important pearl in the talk. It is obvious to our physical therapy colleagues within the ICS, but may not be to physical therapists outside and other providers who don't specialize in treating pain. High tone pelvic floor muscle dysfunction is present in 87% of women with chronic pelvic pain and 13% of women on screening physical exam. The overactive pelvic floor can result in decreased urine flow rates, obstructed defecation, dyspareunia, pain, anxiety, and distress, and can even result in pudendal nerve entrapment. So when referring a patient to physical therapy, she should be educated that down training in this case, rather than Kegels and up training as one would do for stress incontinence, will be the key to improving her symptoms. Physical therapy for high tone pelvic floor dysfunction is a heterogeneous set of, of skills. So one example is steel massage, there's trigger point work, biofeedback can be included, electrical stimulation, breathing and postural work. In randomized trials, pelvic floor physical therapy has been shown to be superior to global therapeutic massage for pelvic pain equivalent to levator injections with or without triamcinolone and bupivacaine, and effective in pelvic girdle pain of pregnancy. 
But due to the heterogeneity of techniques and patient characteristics, more data is needed, which we are beginning to see from our physical therapy colleagues. Psychosocial factors are inherent in any illness that disrupts life, particularly pain, and should be normalized for the patient. Due to the impact of central sensitization of pain on pain processing, the psychological factors should be treated along with the other pain generators. Simple measures, such as giving the patient a locus of control, such as clinic, environment, rescue strategies at home, and patient resources to read, can be very helpful. For patients with more significant maladaptive coping, a psychologist with experience in pain or coping with medical disease, trauma, or even sports medicine will be able to help. Christine, which of the above components were addressed in this patient? Well, this will be the same person who had surgical trauma. She hasn't really had time to uh, somatize or catastrophize, but she certainly has already developed anxiety and depression. So case number one, the approach, chronic pelvic pain after mesh surgery. Identify the inciting event. In this case, it was surgery for incontinence and surgery for prolapse. Treat each pain generator. She had tenderness over the urethra related to the mid-urethral sling. She had mesh exposure at the cervix with a vaginal discharge. She had high tone pelvic floor muscle dysfunction and an increased stress level. So we treated her conservatively for three months. We used estradiol cream because of the extrusion. Her urine culture was negative. Cystoscopy showed urethral erythema and normal bladder and no evidence of erosion. Her vaginal culture was positive and treated. She had high tone pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, which was addressed with physical therapy and a home exercise program, as well as stress management uh, with yoga and mindfulness training. Thank you. So let's talk about mesh erosions. This pearl can be a significant source of concern for surgeons trying to help women with mesh complications. We think through how far to go and how best to help the patient technically without going too far. A staged approach is okay, though we may need to provide reassurance to the patients who feel that urgent intervention is necessary. In the midst of emerging mesh complications in 2010, Muffley and Barber published recommendations on techniques for both mesh insertion and removal and regarding the architecture of the products in existence. These tenets still hold true. So it is important to review the prior operative note, know what's in there and where it passes. In general, we excise the exposed mesh with a one centimeter flap dissected around the perimeter, reapproximate the epithelium, use vaginal estrogen, return to the operating room if needed for further resection. However, we remove as much mesh as possible when prior excision has failed or when infection or fistula is present. Other considerations include the fact that with the trocar kits, the risk and benefit of removing everything changes. So it's often not possible or prudent to remove the arms. In this case, the arms can have neovascularity, so when they're followed to the extent that they can be safely removed, uh, they should be suture ligated. And patient education and the uh, justification for this approach is very important to reduce anxiety. So Christine, first of all, is this what you do? And secondly, do you examine the patient in the operating room the day of surgery or just in the clinic? Well, um, I think you want to excise the mesh over the tender points after pain mapping. So we get an idea of where we're going to need to be operating just in the clinic. But because the uh, positioning is a little different at the time of surgery, before anesthesia, we pain map again. And then in this case, uh, the major sling was excised out and there was a trachelectomy with mesh excision performed. Fortunately for us, we had normal voiding and defecation, minimal pain at six months post-op. Her questionnaires were greatly improved, and she had no recurrence of stress incontinence or prolapse. At least the patient here did not develop recurrent prolapse, but what would you do if she did? 
So the question often arises regarding what to do if a patient reprolapses or has stress incontinence after sling removal. In the case we presented, if she had had stress incontinence or reprolapse, I would have offered her an autologous fascial sling, rectus or fascia lata, or depending on the urethral mobility and the absence of prolapse, I might consider a bulking agent. But for full recurrent prolapse, a uterosacral ligament suspension or sacrospinous ligament fixation would be my approach. And an anterior repair can be augmented with biological graft using human dermis is what I use. And um, I would use PDS to reapproximate to the arcus tendineus fascia pelvis laterally. We are often in the position of counseling regarding surgery in patients who have a long-standing baseline chronic pelvic pain syndrome before any intervention. This is not an uncommon scenario, so it is very important to maintain a high index of suspicion for an underlying pain syndrome. There is a lot to talk about in such cases, so we will move on to a patient who presents with this type of situation. So our second case is, is a 62-year-old female, gravita 2 para 2 with chronic pelvic pain of years duration. She has a history of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, migraines, a history of endometriosis, as well as bladder pain and vulvar pain. She has pain with sitting, and she also notes right groin pain and buttock pain. And you notice when you interview her, she's sitting in a sideways position. She reports a bulge with exertion and at the end of the day and splinting with bowel movements as well as stress urinary incontinence. She has never been treated for her pain. She is not sexually active because of the pain. Note that fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome and the others are commonly associated with chronic pelvic pain syndromes. So when a patient presents with this type of history, a diagnosis of chronic pelvic pain should immediately come to mind. So Christine, how are you going to approach this patient? Well, a thorough examination to start with. The external genitalia are normal. The Q-tip touch test is positive at five over five tenderness at the Steens ostea at 1 and 11 o'clock and the vestibular ostea at 5 and 7 o'clock. The pelvic floor muscles are tender bilaterally at 4 over 4 in tenderness in the coccygis, comma, iliococcygis, and pubococcygis muscles. Perineometry now in this patient shows high tone, high resting tone of 40 centimeters of water pressure, a contraction of only 49, and back to high tone. The bladder and urethra are tender. There is an upslip noted at the right anterior superior iliac spine, and there's a rotated sacrum with a tender SI joint. There is tenderness in the paraspinalis muscles and in the right iliopsoas muscle. If we look at pop in this patient, she's a stage two, and her questionnaires show us seven out of 10 on visual analog scales and uh, FSFI of 14 showing female sexual dysfunction. Elise, what else? So what would I do here? Well, we have a patient who presents believing prolapse is her main issue and potentially the cause of her pain requesting surgery. But what we find is a mild prolapse with urethral hypermobility, tender vulva with inflamed vestibular glands, good estrogenization, a tender bladder and tender pelvic floor muscles with trigger points. She also has pelvic imbalance demonstrated by a rotated sacrum and SI joint dysfunction with involvement of the iliopsoas. I have to say, Christine, I am not eager to operate on this patient, but the differential diagnosis is still an interesting puzzle to solve. So I have a couple of questions for you. We have to remember that many of the nerves impacting the pelvis originate in the lumbar spine. Has she had prior intra-abdominal or pelvic surgery? Or was there a suspicion for spinal disease with a central nervous system tumor or adult tethered cord? She has no significant surgical, neurological, or traumatic history. On your exam, was there a particular cutaneous distribution to the pain, in which case we could map the nerves using the known dermatomes and myotomes? Absolutely not. 
So did you get the sense there was something systemic going on? Uh, yes, with her history of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, the history of endometriosis, and in this case, bladder and vulvar pain. Okay, so uh, this is the small fiber polyneuropathy I referred to in our prior question. In patients with more diffuse pain and multiple pain syndromes, a systemic neuropathy should be suspected. We looked at patients with complex pelvic pain concurrent with multi-system pain and found that two thirds of them had small nerve fiber polyneuropathy. The small nerve fibers serve both somatosensory pain sensation and the autonomic nervous system. So it is not surprising that we see bladder dysfunction hand in hand with pelvic pain in so many of our patients. Patients with small fiber polyneuropathy are more likely to have pain after surgery, which can be permanent despite intervention. It is most prudent to work up and address this pain first and to defer and modify the surgical plan based on the outcome of treatment. Our next pearl is that this patient really has to be re-educated on her pain and given some tools to improve if we are going to have success in treating her. In addition, she will need to receive counseling to cultivate appropriate expectations about her surgery, thereby optimizing the outcome. And that brings us to multidisciplinary collaboration. This patient has more than pelvic pain. I depend heavily on my colleagues in these cases. Nina, tell us how you use multidisciplinary collaboration. Thank you, Elise. This is an important point. Each patient requires individualized and multimodality therapy. The complex problems that these patients manifest may require the assistance of physical therapists, pain specialists, nutritionists, neurologists, especially those who specialize in autonomic dysfunction, gastroenterologists, and rheumatologists. So we need a team. It takes a village. So Christine, how do you handle these patients? The patient's optimal outcome can only be achieved in a multidisciplinary setting. Not only did rheumatology address her systemic pain issues, but physical therapy intervened on her hypertonic pelvic floor. A dietitian was engaged to help with bladder irritants. Her vulvar surface was addressed with estrogen and avoidance of irritants. Her surgical plan was developed after optimizing her pain control. Omitting intervention on her clinically irrelevant prolapse, which, by the way, improved after physical therapy, and focusing on her most bothersome symptom after the pain, the stress incontinence. The autogalous sling was planned intentionally to avoid inflammation and was well tolerated without reaction. Okay, so for surgery and patients with pre existing pain, the take home point is to work up and intervene on the pain prior plan the surgery conservatively, and manage expectations regarding the post-op course and beyond. It is important to note in this patient with pre-existing pain, the ultimate decision was to avoid MASH, and she did well with her autologous sling. Yes, it is very important to engage and counsel the patient regarding the rationale for recommendations. Take-home points, offering surgery in those with pre-existing chronic pelvic pain, Treat the underlying conditions in a multidisciplinary approach, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, neuromodulary medications. Deal with the underlying therapy to produce stability in their pelvic pain for at least three months before considering surgery. Reassess the patient and then electively choose a surgery, but be careful to avoid therapeutic choices that may exacerbate the condition. Avoid obstruction. The patient already has a history of high tone pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. Avoid an abdominal approach to avoid uh, risking an increased pain. Consider an autogalous pubovaginal sling versus a synthetic midurethral sling. And mesh should be used with caution in the context of underlying pelvic pain syndromes. So we return to the themes that we have illustrated and expanded upon during this program. These are the lessons that we hope you will incorporate into your practices to become more comfortable dealing with this complex population. First, a thorough history is essential to elicit any 
prior or current pain syndromes, such as dis, uh, symptoms such as dyspareunia, as well as concomitant pain conditions such as fibromyalgia. Childhood genital urinary problems or abuse can often be clues to adult pathology. Use of questionnaires and a complete record review will also provide critical background information. The physical examination is focused on the abdomen and pelvis with particular attention to the condition of the mucosal surfaces of the vulva and vagina, as well as the bulk, tone, and tenderness of the levator complex. The initial workup should consist of a post-void residual, Q-tip sensitivity test, and relevant cultures with additional testing guided by the patient's history or findings on exam or your analysis. It is essential that an underlying pain condition be addressed before proceeding with surgery. There are many tools available to us, including behavioral interventions, pelvic floor rehabilitation, or medication. In addressing pain in these complex patients, it is often necessary to seek the assistance of one or more collaborators and other medical specialties who have experience in treating pain syndromes. Although it's not uncommon for centers of excellence to establish a multi-specialty collaborative group to share clinic time providing comprehensive efficient care for these often challenging patients, it is still possible to collaborate effectively without an institutional structure. The use of estrogen to increase vulvovaginal tissue vascularity and restore an acidic pH to the vagina sets the stage for improving pelvic health. Patients also need to be reminded to avoid the use of irritants. Even over vigorous cleansing can cause vulvar discomfort and even recurrent urinary tract infection. We rely very heavily on our physiotherapist colleagues to downregulate and rebalance the pelvic floor, since a majority of patients with pelvic pain syndromes have high tone pelvic floor dysfunction. Surgery should not occur until pain management is optimized. If a mesh complication is involved, review of any prior procedures and anatomic considerations should govern the surgical planning. Becoming comfortable with evaluating these patients will lead to greater diagnostic competence and insights into the pathophysiology of genitourinary tract function. Finally, the education of pain patients regarding the nature of their syndrome is well worth the time involved. Not only are trust and a strong therapeutic relationship established, but the patients derive hope that mitigation of their suffering is possible, and then they are met motivated to participate in their care. We would like to remind our viewers that the ICS standardization documents are available as free downloads from the ICS website. There are also numerous videos on all topics relevant to voiding function and dysfunction, as well as pelvic floor disorders. These are available for viewing, including all of the preceding webinars. And speaking of videos, specifically for those interested in surgical management of mesh, mesh complications, there are a number of very high quality videos, workshops, and lectures that are easily searchable on ICS TV. And for those of you who wish to explore this topic of pelvic pain further, or to offer your patients resources on the subject, we have provided a list of useful sites. Also, please join us for our, our next pain web, webinar, 10 Pearls for the Differential Diagnosis of Pain in All Genders, scheduled for June 26th at 1230 Eastern Standard Time in the US and 1730 GMT in Europe. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this presentation on pelvic pain syndromes and pelvic floor reconstructive surgery. And we look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Uh, we have several questions already waiting and um, I want to uh, thank my uh, co-speakers. And now we're going to address some of these questions. So um, this is a, a question that we hear quite commonly, actually, even from our patients. How often, and I'll, I'll address this to Christine, how often do you see patients with chronic pelvic pain 
due to chlamydia trachomatis in your practice? Uh, probably um, a fair amount because we tend to look for it now. Uh, that and all the other mycoplasmas. Uh, the testing is uh, better covered now by insurance companies and certainly that's a treatable situation and as opposed to so many things that are not treatable, but you won't be able to treat it unless you look for it. Thank you. Elise, a question from Dr. Goldman. How soon would you proceed to surgery in someone with very significant pain? How, I, I guess there would be two parts to that question. So if there's mesh erosion and they have very significant pain and you're pretty confident it has to do with the mesh, it always takes a little while to get somebody onto surgery. So I would, I would start my conservative therapies concurrently and use my judgment about the three month mark. Um, uh, somebody who has pre-existing pain in whom I'm planning surgery. I recently had a patient with small fiber polyneuropathy who had stress incontinence and needed a sling. Um, we worked carefully with her neurologist and optimized her pain. And we planned her surgery as an autologous sling so that it would be less reactive. And she actually, in fact, did well with no worsening of her pain. But her baseline pain, which existed, was optimized. Okay, this is a question I have for Christine. Um, when do you do cystoscopy in pain patients? And do you do your cystoscopies in the office or under anesthesia? I'm always concerned about causing a flare of their pain. Uh, good question. 40% uh, or more of bladder pain patients have microhematuria. So you are obliged at some point to get an upper tract study and do at least an office cystoscopy. However, I do prefer to do it in the operating room because if they have a Hunter lesion, it can be treated uh, at the time of your cystoscopy with anesthesia. So I tend not to do cystoscopy in the office on these pain patients. And of course, your culture and cytology would be norm, would be negative as well. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Hamid. Uh, first, for mesh-related pain requiring surgery, do you uh, recommend removing the whole tape? I think we did talk about that a little bit, uh, including both arms of just from the vagina initially. Uh, but at least I think you can um, uh, review this again because this is a very important part of the treatment of pelvic pain. Sure, Dr. Hamid, I, I, it, it's a good question because I think it specifically relates to the sling, and so I will. Uh, I'll determine what part of the sling hurts, uh, how much the patient worries about recurrent stress incontinence versus the pain. And based on the conversation with them and the level of pain and the location, I, I will do either a staged removal where I might remove half if it's only painful on one side, or if they really want the whole thing out or it seems like the better judgment, I'll remove everything that I can reach up until uh, the point where it goes out through the obturator foramen or up into the retroperitoneum. And then if the pain persists or there's a, any kind of further problem, you can do more. Uh, there are some actually very nice videos with various techniques uh, on ICS-TV answering that exact question and with various approaches. If I could add something else, what I have found at times for those people with retroperitoneal slings, that I have re removed all the suburethral component, but I have had to go back occasionally and I have to go back transabdominally behind the pubis to remove the arms in order to get rid of that deep pain that's left over. So I com completely you agree with you, yes. But have you, have you done it as the first operation or do you stage it? No, I stage it for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then Dr. Hamid had a second part to his question. If you are removing a tape for mesh-related complications and the patient has recurrent incontinence, will you do an anti-incontinence procedure at the same time or remove the tape in, in, in the initial setting and come back later to undertake definitive anti-incontinence surgery? That's a great question. Um, I can't say it's been this way in every single case, but typically I would wait and come back. Do you both agree? Oh, absolutely, because you don't know what you're going to end up with, uh, especially if you mobilize the urethra uh, and it's not stuck in scar tissue. It may spontaneously be better. 
Uh, and then if you do the sling right away, you might have put mesh in there where you didn't need to. So I would always wait. I, and I would I would replace with autologous and P physical therapy. I'm sure we all send them to PT in between as well. No, absolutely. But a lot of them, there's sufficient scarring left over or they otherwise improve. And I'm always surprised at how few actually develop recurrent incontinence. Yes. Also, um, if the if the urethra is fairly fixed by this point because of the scarring, a bulking agent may salvage the situation. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, good point. Okay. Okay, I have a quick question for Christine before we close. Would you please describe the anesthetic challenge, your technique, and, the, and what oh, yeah. you do with the findings? Well, first of all, it identifies the bladder and or urethra as a pain generator. So what you do is you take a 10 French catheter and put alkalinized lidocaine in the bladder for 20 minutes and then drain it. it requires re-examining the patient. You examined the patient before you did it. She had a tender bladder and or urethra and tender pelvic floor muscles and skin and everything else. But after the procedure, the bladder should be non-tender. And what's interesting is that once you take the bladder pain away, oftentimes the muscle spasm isn't as great. And if the urethra is still tender? Well, in, in our case, it was tender because she was reacting to the mesh. But if the urethra is still tender, it might be a separate pathology and would want one to go forward and perhaps do some imaging or directly visualizing with the cystoscopy. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank again all of my co-presenters for a very successful presentation. And we look forward to the coming presentation. There has been a question about, uh, about male patients with chronic pelvic pain. And I believe that Dr. Day and her co-presenter will be presenting this on June 26. So I would advise everybody who's interested in the male side of things to uh, tune in at that time. So thanks again for attending and uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.